and uh, appreciate you all joining us tonight. This is uh, going to be on the topic of backcountry safety, and this should be some applicable information, whether you're a hiker, a camper, a hunter, or just somebody who picnics in the, in the, the backcountry. There's a lot of things on safety, and we're going to tag team this one. Jeremy is going to start us out talking about wildlife safety. Shad is going to touch on insect safety and some plant concerns that you may encounter. And then I'm going to talk about uh, safe drinking water while you're in the back country. So, uh, so Jeremy, I'll, I'll let you start us out here. All right. Thank you, Phil. Let me share my screen real quick. And everybody should be able to see that. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, camping with wildlife. Uh, think safety. You know, I think uh, uh, if you camp, if you're if you're camping, if you're this could pertain to even hiking or just uh, uh, anything. Spending some time out in uh, in the woods, uh, which is something I think uh, a lot of us just really enjoy. But definitely going to take a spin. Uh, towards camping uh, with wildlife. Um, so to get started, I will say, and I think uh, Phil's going to cover this, Phil or Shad's one may cover this as well, the less you pack to the campsite, the less you have to pack out. And when I say that, and that also includes food, um, you know, it's one of those things, of whatever you carry in, carry out. And if you're a good steward, uh, if you see something, you'll also pack that out. Uh, I have been out on hikes with Shad and picked up items that people left and uh, they would, uh, uh, you know, we would have to pack those out. So whatever you pack to that campsite, uh, the less you have to pack out, and that includes food. Also, how far from the vehicle are you camping? Now, we've got some really, uh, really cool camping uh, locations here in Harlan County. And uh, basically, the tent site is right next to your vehicle. You could park your vehicle right next to it. Uh, so uh, that uh, allows you to be able to, uh, you know, camp fairly close to your car. So you may be able to leave items in there. Uh, so, but how far are you camping? Are you camping, you know, you may be camping a half a day, half a day's hike in, into, the, uh, into the woods, where you're, whether you're on one of the trail systems like the Pine Mountain State Scenic Trail, or uh, uh, maybe even in the, uh, uh, the National Forest, something like that. So how far from the vehicle are you camping? That's something you gotta look at. Uh, that gets back to that bullet number one, the less you pack to the campsite, the less you pack out. Also, what is the status of the wildlife in, in the area that you're camping in? Uh, it's one of those things of, you know, we've got bears in this area. Uh, we've, uh, we've had Seth Thompson to speak on bears twice. He's done a really good job of covering that. So I'm not going to get into a lot of that, but, uh, you know, think about what kind of wildlife you've got in your area, uh, especially when you're dealing with bears. So uh, in Eastern Kentucky, like I mentioned, Southwest Virginia, we've got plenty of bears. So that's something that we're going to address here this evening, uh, this evening because you've got to think about that. And the big thing is, is uh, food storage. You want to try to decrease that human and bear interaction. Uh, today uh, was garbage day, garbage pickup day here in my neighborhood. And early this morning, I took a walk around the neighborhood and there had been bears that had come through during the night. So you gotta think about food storage. When you're going out, you're camping, you're tent camping, uh, whether you're camping in a tent, a hammock, uh, you gotta think about the food storage. Uh, is there a bear, is there bears nearby? So something we're going to cover. So first of all, bagging food. And uh, a couple of examples. This is a clothesline method. And uh, it's a really good, a really good idea here. Uh, basically, you're uh, pulling a, uh, a, a rope. Uh, you can use pulleys. Uh, they're not shown, uh, but they're using two limbs. And it's a little bit harder for that bear to, to get through there. So basically, uh, you attempt to find a, uh, a tree, uh, a couple of trees that are 10, 12 feet apart and try to raise that, uh, that bag, uh, your backpack, whatever you're carrying your food in, try to raise that up off the ground uh, up to, uh, uh, you know, 12 feet and try to get it in the center of those. So if you can get it out away from those trees, six foot or so, 
bear comes through, he's going to smell it. Seth talked about that, how good they could smell. And uh, so that's a good example right there. So this is something you need to think about. Also, here is a single tree in a pulley. Uh, they just attached a rope and uh, made a pulley and they pulled it up six foot off that single tree in case you don't have another, uh, have two trees, you can uh, raise it off the ground and then tie it off to a stump, you know, tree or log. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it says down there in the lower right hand corner, you can throw rocks or firewood at the bear if it tries to get your food. Or it also says use a bear resistant food container. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. So basically you wanna get that food off the ground, 12 foot, and away from the tree six foot that way that bear can't reach out there to it now they uh, this all this information comes from the u.s forest service and this is something they don't recommend but this may be something you you have to do um, <clears throat> it's easiest for bears to figure it out but it may be hardest to find a suitable tree with a long limb on it that's six foot long and 12 foot off the ground or uh, basically more than that 15 16 foot off the ground so you want to try to get that off the ground as much as, as 12 foot, uh, if at all possible. So um, there's uh, just a few tips on, on bagging uh, for uh, uh, bagging your food uh, to keep it away from bears or even, even uh, raccoons or whatever. Uh, so here's a bear canister. One of the things that you want to do is uh, with the bear canisters, they, they work great. They're a little bit bigger. Uh, so it's not like you've got some rope and a backpack. You've got a canister that you're going to have in your pack. So uh, you're going to have to think a little bit about it. One of the things, if you'll notice, they took all of the items out of their, their original uh, containers and they put those in, uh, in bags, uh, sealable bags, and that way that they could stack those a whole lot neater inside the um, um, inside the uh, bear canister. If you'll notice, they've got some dried noodles there. Look like they got some apricots or what have you, and maybe some uh, uh, different items. I see some uh, uh, granola bars down in there in the, in the blue bag. And so uh, being able to put that in there and the sealable bags uh, into a bear, bear canister is great. Uh, these, uh, these are fairly inexpensive. I didn't get a, uh, get a price on here on these, but they're fairly inexpensive and they do work well. Uh, so that's another option as well, but it's gonna be a little bit more bulky if you're having to carry into uh, an area. Now, this is a picture also from the US Forest Service. Uh, they, uh, this is a campsite food, food pole uh, to, if you'll notice the, the bags that are hanging from that. These are also located on the Pine Mountain State Scenic Trail. If you've been along the trail to any of the campsites or the shelters, there is a pole that sets out from the campsite or the shelter uh, to allow you to hang your, uh, hang your food on it. The bear cannot get up the pole. Uh, and so um, you're able to hang your food out there to keep it away from the bear. Now I mentioned these campsites as well that, uh, that allow you to park your car close. It may be something you wanna keep your, uh, your food in your car. Now uh, you'll, you'll have to be careful about that too is you may get your uh, uh, get some damage done to your car. Uh, saw recently here here in Harlan County uh, some folks that put some trash in the trunk of their car and they came out the next morning and the whole right rear quarter panel was removed uh, because the bear smelled the trash. So uh, the bear, uh, as we know, has got a good nose. Uh, what Seth talked about, told us all about it. So uh, these are just some ideas there. Also, some camping and camp cooking and food stores locations. You know, you got you need to look at uh, some areas uh, where you're where you're camping at, especially in the back country. Uh, a lot of these that are already have pre-staged areas, your pre-staged uh, campsites, they are spread out. But if it's one of those things that you're out in the back country, if you can set up a sleeping area, kind of in a triangle away from your food cache and your cooking area by at least a hundred yards. So you've got a triangular uh, area there uh, that you can look at. Also, uh, try not to eat, uh, cook, or keep food inside your tent, uh, because the thing is, it's gonna come in there. Uh, so attempting to keep uh, the food out of the tent. Uh, if you're uh, in a shelter area, keeping the food out of there, uh, if at all possible. 
that's going to reduce that bear and humor, uh, human interaction. Uh, so just remember to store your food in a bear resistant container or hang from a tree. Switching, uh, here, before we switch gears here, uh, some campsite tips. Like I mentioned, never leave food or co coolers unattended. Uh, uh, all food, food particles, trash and coolers need to be secured in a vehicle or trailer. Um, always keep a clean picnic area, uh, campsite or other area where you uh, may spend, uh, be spending some time. Don't leave any food, uh, food particles, trash and coolers out when not in use. Uh, if you don't attract bears, you'll at least attract ants. So keeping things cleaned up. Store food in bear resistant units like we talked about. Uh, hard shell vehicles or car trunks. Uh, also never store your food in your tent, like I mentioned. So let's change gears totally. Uh, talk about bear defense spray. Uh, there's a lot of it out there on the, uh, on the market. The, the OC sprays, pepper sprays, that sort of thing. And you can buy those about anywhere uh, or order them uh, via the internet. I will say, first of all, make sure you know how to use it. If need be, get some training uh, on how to use it. Uh, yeah, they may be simple to use, but you need to know how to use it. Uh, uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, have a training uh, a few years back and it was, it was pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, so if you, if you get trained on that, on how to use uh, these, pepper, uh, these pepper sprays or OC sprays uh, for wildlife, uh, I would recommend it highly. I said, uh, you can purchase this stuff from most sporting goods stores, uh, anywhere where they would sell sporting goods, hiking, uh, backpacking, uh, camping uh, uh, items. Uh, the spray cans are generally good for two or three years. After that, they need to be replaced because you definitely don't want to uh, pack one out there and say, and need it, and it doesn't work. And so uh, make sure you, you, you know, uh, keep a date on it, you know, write a date on it, that how long you've had it, and get rid of those after two or three years. Hey, let me ask you a question about that, Jeremy. Yeah. Do you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot. If I do, uh, I apologize. But have you used those cans before? Just the ones in the training. Uh, I've never used, I never used the ones, uh, you know, you can get some, uh, th this is a good segue, I guess. You can get some, some drift from them. Uh, they can drift back on you, and uh, uh, when you get that stuff, uh, you know, even a taste of it, you'll want some, you know, it'd be good to have some potatoes around, you know, uh, for the taste, but uh, uh, other than the training can, I've never used one. Uh, but The reason uh, I ask about it is we, I did the training uh, mm -hmm. with Robert Myers with Parks. Yes. And, mm -hmm. uh, we had a problem bear at the office that was getting in the dumpster, mm -hmm. and I decided I was going to haze that bear with uh, some of the sprays that we had. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took a can out there and it was new. I, I hadn't had it, uh, but maybe a month or two. <clears throat> and I would, I'm, I'm being serious. I'm not sure that the spray on that can went more than about five feet. Um, so it, it just made me nervous that if it's only five feet, the bear's practically on top of you before, and I just wondered, it's possible that was a dud. Um, I wondered if you'd had any experience with them. I'm not, other than that one, uh, that one, that training session, if you remember, those things would shoot out there 15, 20 feet or more, uh, yeah. 15, 20 feet. And so, uh, yeah, it makes you wonder if there was uh, an issue with that. Uh, and so uh, that, that can be alarming, definitely. It was to me <laughs> and I yeah. got the drift because of it, you know, so. Right, uh, exactly. Because the thing is, uh, it, it, it not going any further than uh, five feet. It has the, uh, it has the more possibility to drift. Uh, and so, yeah, that, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, I've never gotten it in my eyes. I've never gotten OC spray in my eyes. Oh, I got a little bit, but, I've had a taste of it, you know, uh, inhale it, whatever. But uh, uh, matter of fact, it was uh, it was on uh, uh, with hazing a bear, uh, the person I was with. Uh, so that that's good information, Shad. Uh, also, if using the spray, uh, get the biggest can possible. Uh, 
you know, they're generally nine to 15 ounces uh, and the cost range is gonna be 30 to $50. So they're not cheap. Uh, and you make sure they've got an EPA registration number on them. That makes, uh, means that they're a little bit more valid than, than others. So also most of the large cans come with a holster. Make sure you have one. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, have your spray on your belt and available. It doesn't need to be in your, uh, in your backpack. It does you no good there. So um, make sure you know how to use the spray. Uh, read the manufacturer's instructions and uh, uh, give it a test spray, that sort of thing. And I'm not sure about the test spray. That's going to have to come back to the manufacturer's instructions. So, uh, you know, if you're dealing with things even, even around the house, like wasp spray, uh, over time, uh, and this gets back to what Shad was talking about, over time, those things will kind of uh, lose the, uh, their firepower, so to speak. So uh, uh, definitely this gives you some ideas of what you might want to think about. The good thing is it's like, uh, it's one of the things that Seth talked about. And when I talk about uh, bears as well, uh, most of the time, uh, unless you're just really confronted and uh, it, it's, it's a bear that uh, doesn't seem to be want uh, to be scared, uh, they, uh, they are pretty much, uh, uh, shy and they'll avoid humans. And so the good thing is, is they'll tend to leave you alone. Now, if you've got something at a campsite that's making them come in, uh, that may be a different thing. So, uh, uh, but if you're looking at using the bear, bear to spin spray, I will say if you can get trained, uh, even if it's, uh, watching a, a training video on a, on a, you know, from YouTube or whatever, definitely check into that. Uh, and that's all I had. That's all I had. And I'll stop uh, sharing my screen and uh, I'll turn it over to back over to Phil. Right, thank you, Jeremy. Any questions for Jeremy at this point? Good information there, Shad. I think, I think that's something that uh, we, we definitely need to look at when purchasing. And, you know, uh, it's one of those things of it may have been the, uh, that the, uh, the aerosol or whatever in that can may have just died, so to speak. And, uh, uh, and, and, and the sad thing is you, you don't know because those, uh, those cans are not like fire extinguishers. Uh, they don't have a, uh, a gauge on them that says, Hey, they're good or bad. So I guess that's, that's kind of the downfall of it. You just gotta, you're, you're hoping for the best with it. But I'll go ahead and turn it over to back over to Phil. Thanks. Thank I was you. going to say, I found out after the fact that there are different manufacturers and it's possible that uh, one manufacturer is better uh, than another. So maybe look at product reviews when you purchase the spray. Good if, anybody, if anybody thinks of a question related to wildlife, uh, just, just feel free to type that in the chat box and, uh, and we can address that at the end if you don't have something now, but otherwise, uh, Shad, it's your turn. Okay, it, you're gonna have to enable me to share. Okay, good to go. Bear with me just a second. I'm having to uh, Okay, are you guys seeing that? Yes. Okay. Is it full screen? Uh, it isn't, isn't it? Yeah, now it is. Okay. So this presentation was provided by Dr. Rick Beston with the University of Kentucky, and we had asked him specifically to list out some of the uh, most problematic uh, arthropods or insects that folks might encounter as they're outdoors. And these species are the ones that are active for most of the year. And uh, all of these are gonna be common in wooded or shady areas. Some of the tick species are uh, kind of seasonal. Uh, the ones that are native like the American dog tick 
are going to be uh, active uh, just for certain months of the year. But we've got the new, uh, or relatively new for us, the black-legged tick that is an, uh, a year-round. Uh, it's active all year round. And so uh, that's, that's something to keep in mind. But some of these can transmit pathogens that cause a lot of serious diseases uh, such as Lyme and uh, ehrlichiosis and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. There are others that uh, cause allergies to uh, different uh, red meat and um, just a lot of different uh, things to keep in mind. So, whoops. Um, as far as what you can do about it, I've always been uh, personally a little uh, reluctant to spray and that's true at home uh, and it's also true on my person. I, I've resisted using DEET and OFF and different things, but some of these ticks, um, the, the ones that we had historically had, they had to be attached for 48 hours before they could transmit uh, the disease, such as Lyme disease. But th the new ones that are coming in have the ability to transmit like the, the meat allergy as soon as they bite in. And so it's not a 48 hour thing anymore, it's as soon as they attach. And that food allergy can last for upwards of three years or more. And that would eliminate pork, beef, um, you know, pepperoni, uh, all manner of, of red meats. And so I don't know what your all's eating habits are, but uh, red meat is pretty important to me. And so I've suddenly gotten a little more serious about uh, the prevention. But be aware when you're in tick habitat, uh, one of the best things that you can do is wear protective clothing. Typically, they recommend that it be something light colored, uh, so maybe a khaki, so that you can actually see the ticks. Uh, some of these are very small. They're, a lot of times it's an immature uh, nymphal stage of the, the tick, so it, it's not necessarily the, the adult some of the nymphs will actually feed uh, on adult uh, or on humans as well. So, uh, and that's different from, from our uh, old ticks, uh, the American dog tick. I think it was just the adult stage that feeds on humans. But wearing that protective clothing, using an insect repellent. So this can be picaritin, uh, it can be uh, DEET, uh, I think most of the sprays are 30, 40%, all the way up to 100% on the DEET. But just make sure that you're using a, a good insect repellent. Uh, you can also use permethrin-based sprays to treat your clothing. And I believe when um, Jonathan Larson spoke to us a, a few weeks back, he made mention about the fact that that uh, permethrin-based spray uh, would actually kill the ticks uh, on your clothing as soon as they came on. So it's not a repellent, it's actually, uh, 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 it will kill the insect. Um, show you that, I apologize for getting up. If you can see this, um, I'm not endorsing any particular manufacturer, but uh, this is one that I found and it's, um, it treats up to five complete outfits. So if you've got, you know, hiking pants or hunting pants or something that you routinely use, you could treat it with this. You can't spray it on you. You have to pre-treat and let it dry, but uh, that's supposed to work through, I think it was four washes at least. They also sell clothing that's got it impregnated into the fabric. And those are supposed to be good for upwards of 40 washes. So those are things to think about. You also need to uh, give some consideration to your pets. Um, dogs in particular, if you take those out in the woods to hunt or to hike or to bird or whatever you do, um, those become uh, kind of a springboard for introducing uh, ticks and things back into your lawn. So uh, if you put a collar or a treatment on your, your dog, that kind of cuts that uh, step out and, and will help protect you as well. You need to perform regular tick checks. Um, there was a place that we uh, hiked in Pennsylvania that was kind of an open, uh, brushy, a uh, lot of undergrowth and grass that was right up against the trail. 
which is pretty common on certain parts of the Clinch Ranger District. And obviously a lot of our trails, um, some of them are kind of brushy if they've had wildfire or if it happens to be a place that's more open. And uh, when we stopped, I think I pulled eight ticks uh, off of just uh, me and um, the, the whole group, there were three of us, we, we collected 16 ticks uh, off and we hadn't been in the woods an hour. So uh, you need to do those regular checks and make sure that nothing is on you. If you uh, start down low, you know, they, they typically are waiting on grass or something, they're gonna hook on and catch a ride. So just make sure that you start looking at your shoes and uh, work your way up and remove those ticks safely if they do uh, get attached. Uh, make sure that you get the entire mouth part so that it doesn't become infected. You may also encounter black widow spiders. Uh, um, there are three related species and, and not all of them have that hourglass pattern that, that you might uh, think is the, the only kind that we have. That's, that's the one that you see here on the right, top right. But there are others that, that have red on them, but it's not that hourglass shape. And all of these are black widows. Uh, all of them have an extremely painful bite. Uh, they don't tend to be very aggressive, and they, but they, they take cover under things that you may uh, pick up. So it might be firewood. Um, I've, I've encountered them when I was putting my blueberry nets down this year. I was flipping rocks over to to put to weigh the netting down. And there was a, a black widow uh, with its uh, webbing underneath one of those rocks. I've also uh, crawled into a tent before and had a black widow in the tent on the floor. And I'm not sure how it got in there, uh, but, but it was there. So uh, just keep that in mind. Gloves can provide uh, protection of hands. So if you know you're gonna be doing something that you're gonna be disturbing rocks or wood or something that they might be hiding under, uh, it might be a good idea to, to wear those gloves. It's also probably a pretty good idea if you haven't made it a habit to, uh, to spray uh, around the perimeter of your home. And uh, it's also a good argument for keeping firewood and things stacked maybe a little bit away uh, from where people are gonna frequent uh, just so that you cut down on the a possible interaction uh, with them. Um, next thing is stinging caterpillars. And uh, I, I know Chris probably gets excited when he sees, this, sees these for a totally different reason, but uh, um, my wife's grandmother hates anything uh, that even resembles a, a caterpillar uh, or a worm. And so we've got more than a dozen species uh, in Kentucky, and, and I'm, I'm sure that that number holds for Virginia, that uh, are capable of stinging. Uh, probably the best known one in our area is the pack saddle, but we also have um, others that um, I've encountered at the cane, uh, cane patch campground. Uh, there's some kind of a little white caterpillar that you get in the, the fall that feeds on the sycamore trees. And uh, those um, uh, can kind of sting, but they have uh, hollow poison filled hairs. And uh, uh, if you see any spiny caterpillar, don't touch it. Um, if just cause it looks pretty uh, or unusual, neat. Uh, I, I believe that they were designed uh, to look a certain way for a reason. I was telling my wife earlier that generally in nature, anytime you see something that's red, uh, that's a telltale sign that uh, you need to stay away. If it's a mushroom, if it's a berry for the most part, um, but for caterpillars, if you, if you see spines or uh, unusual uh, long stiff hairs, uh, avoid those. And if you do get stung, you can use tape, uh, duct tape or, or something to remove them. Uh, they, they pull out relatively easily. Um, now we come to the stinging wasps or, or bees, and um, we have uh, a lot of these, many uh, species. Some live in colon, uh, colonies and some are solitary. And usually by this time of the year and later during peak time to be outdoors, uh, that's when their numbers have reached their maximum. Um, 
it, it doesn't say it here in the slideshow, but uh, I don't remember if it was Rick Besson or, or Dr. Mike Potter that uh, told us this once upon a time that uh, the yellow jacket uh, was the most uh, deadly insect in North America. And it was responsible for more deaths and more trips to the hospital than any other single uh, arthropod in the country. So, uh, and part of that is because they build up large colonies and they defend their, their colonies very aggressively. And so not all of these are gonna be aggressive. Uh, some are pretty passive, but yellow jackets are probably the worst and uh, hornets are probably a very close second. Um, bumblebees can sting. Uh, obviously the, uh, all kinds of wasps, um, mud divers and that kind of thing, all of those can sting. But uh, if it's a honeybee and you know it's a honeybee, you can remove the stinger with your thumb and it's only gonna hit you once. And uh, it may feel like you're being stung multiple times with a honeybee, but uh, really it's only once. On these others, they can sting repeatedly. Um, I was stung by a yellow jacket uh, mowing one time and uh, the thing uh, stung me through my sock and I'm not sure how it was even possible that it did this. I had on big tube socks, so that tells you this was back in the 80s. But uh, I swatted to brush the, the yellow jacket off my sock. And instead of knocking the yellow jacket off, it rolled my sock down. And that yellow jacket stung me five times in a row through that sock, even though the sock would have been getting thicker as it went around. So kind of peculiar, but... Um, this is probably the one that you need to be most uh, sensitive to, especially if you're out tent camping. Uh, real often, yellow jackets in particular will build nests in the, the old mouse holes and tunnels, and uh, it's not always obvious that there's a nest there. We've come up on them uh, on the trail uh, unaware, and uh, you don't even have to do anything to them. Sometimes they will just come after you. My advice would be, if you get stung the first time, do not lollygag. Um, I was out with a, a guy from the Forest Service uh, one year, and he stepped into what we believe was a rotten tree stump that had a yellow jacket's nest in that uh, place underground, and it kind of collapsed under his foot. And he stood there and swatted at him. And uh, you're not gonna swat enough to uh, take care of an entire colony of yellow jackets. So, and this is true for hornets, yellow jackets, anything. If you get stung, get away. Uh, I will tell you to be careful. Uh, sometimes it causes a fight or flight response and you can get started running down a hill and uh, lose control and uh, break a leg or, or do something far worse than the yellow jacket sting. So, if you do run, don't panic. Um, but I, I would just say be careful and, and get away. It's also handy to keep a, a cap with you to wear a ball cap uh, because it gives you something to, to swap with. And a lot of times you can keep them beat off of you like if they're trying to sting you through your pants. Uh, you can smack them and knock them away uh, with the ball cap and, and continue on your way. Um, we don't often think about it, but mosquitoes can be uh, a dangerous insect. Uh, there, we've got a lot of uh, species. Uh, some come out during the day. Uh, some are evening and night biting species, uh, but they can transmit uh, pathogens that can cause disease. And uh, I know most of you have heard of West Nile at this point and uh, the encephalitis, which is uh, the brain swelling uh, that comes with Zika and uh, uh, dengue and uh, malaria. I think there's also a uh, chikungunya. Uh, there's several, several different things that you can get uh, from uh, mosquitoes. And uh, so as far as prevention, again, protective clothing. I know uh, in July and August, it, it's hot, it's humid, and there is a uh, maybe an inclination to want to wear shorts and short sleeve shirts but you're always better off wearing long pants and long sleeve uh, sun shirts or you know, something of that nature uh, when you're out in the woods. Uh, it's gonna provide that level of protection. Again, the insect repellent or the, uh, 
the, uh, the treatment of your clothing. Avoid dawn and dusk. And if it's around your home, make sure that you're addressing standing water around the home. I know this is mostly a, a backcountry talk, but because it's been so wet this year, um, I'm seeing a lot of issues with mosquitoes very early. And it's provided a lot of uh, breeding um, habitat for mosquitoes. So make sure that your drains, your um, uh, gutters, uh, flower pots and those things aren't standing and holding water. Turn them upside down. Uh, make sure that uh, your gutters are unstopped. If you've got any buckets, tarps, anything like that that catches water, make sure that it's going to drain and dry out very quickly. You don't, uh, you don't want to have a place that has standing water. Uh, and uh, if you're out in the woods, uh, obviously it's not an option, uh, but, but you can select the places that you choose to camp. And so if you, if you favor places that uh, have a little bit of a breeze, uh, maybe that are up on higher, drier ridges as opposed to being down in uh, low, uh, moist, swampy places, uh, I think you're going to be happy with the results. Uh, the breeze helps keep them blown away and uh, it also the drier places will have fewer mosquitoes. We do also have uh, a blood sucking uh, cone nose and it's a single species. It feeds at night uh, and it can uh, transmit uh, uh, Chagas um, and um, the species we have very rarely transmits it but it can and uh, you might mistake this for a, a box elder bug or um, um, what's the other one, Phil, that feeds on the milkweed, the, I guess the milkweed. Milkweed bug. Yeah, uh, because it's got a kind of a similar coloration to it. But uh, uh, if you're gonna be outdoors, uh, I know some folks like to cowboy camp. Uh, this is a strong argument for using a tent. Uh, it's going to help with mosquitoes, uh, it's going to help with uh, spiders, uh, and it's going to help with, with this uh, blood-sucking cone nose. And uh, make sure that you keep the windows and doors screened uh, if, if, uh, if you're going to have the windows open at night. There's some here that are just bothersome biters. Uh, they're not going to cause, you know, they're not really dangerous, but they can just be pesky. and. Uh, um, there's really just a few species, but we do have some centipedes that will bite. Uh, we have some large bugs and obviously ants, uh, red ants, and uh, um, I don't know what you've got in Virginia compared to us, if there might be a slight difference, but uh, I know in some parts of Kentucky, uh, we have fire ants that have come in. And so if you have the choice, make sure that you avoid picking up unknown insects. And this is probably less common for adults, but uh, if you've got little kids, small children, they have a tendency to grab hold of things. And so uh, I would say just keep an eye on them and be careful what you're letting them pick up. That's all I have on the insects. Uh, now I'm gonna go into this other one here. And this is one that I'm hoping Phil is gonna help me a little bit on. Can you all see that one? Not yet. Hmm. Let me screen sharing has stopped. Let me, uh... There we go. Now you should see it. Yes. Okay. So this is just a, a real quick run through of some common woodland plants that are poisonous or harmful. And uh, if you're gonna be out in the woods, you need to know about them. And we're talking really about two different issues here. The first set of plants that we're gonna talk about have contact reactions. So it's kind of something that is on your skin. It's kind of a, a dermatological uh, reaction. It can be allergic. Uh, which can be specific to the individual. I know Phil and I were talking earlier about a few of these plants and some people have no reaction to them at all. Or if they do, it's a very limited reaction. 
other people are very sensitive to it. And so um, we're gonna hit on some of these and just recognize that they may or may not affect you personally, but they may affect somebody in your group or your family, but they can cause rashes, blisters, and itching. The second set of plants we're gonna cover uh, are ingestion reactions. So it's things that you have eaten and those can cause allergic reactions. They can cause stomach upset, nausea, vomiting, um, a multitude of uh, uh, reactions uh, up to and including death. So uh, we're gonna try to do our best uh, and, and cover these, but um, sometimes it, it can be as simple as something that you've touched or brushed against. Uh, and definitely that's the case with stinging nettle. Uh, and, but sometimes it's uh, not necessarily a thorn or a spine that's on the plant. It can just be an oil or a compound that the plant uh, produces uh, that you have the reaction to. And obviously the first uh, plant we're going to talk about, uh, no talk of this kind is, is uh, worth anything if it doesn't cover poison ivy. And I know most of you have probably heard the old uh, expression, leaves of three, leave it be. And we have other plants that have three leaves on it, but uh, poison ivy is the, uh, the main culprit. Kind of has a um, uh, toothed leaf to it, and, and we'll have a good look at a leaf here in just a second, but it can be either on the ground or vining, and uh, some people uh, mistakenly think that that's two different plants, and it's, it's not. Um, we have uh, poison ivy plants that are immature, that are just down on the ground, just getting started, and uh, over time they send out vines that can climb the trees with anchor roots, and that they can even form bushes. Uh, maybe if the, the tree dies, uh, the, the poison ivy can grow as a bush on its own. I have seen that just a few times, it's not real common. But the active ingredient that causes the problem is an oil, uh, or an oil, if you're away from here, uh, that is uh, urushiol, or, or urushiol is, is how I would say that. But um, it, it typically takes about 40 minutes for it to penetrate the skin. So don't think that if you just touch the poison ivy that you're gonna immediately get the reaction or that you're, you're um, automatically or eventually gonna get it. If you can get somewhere, if you know you've touched it, if you can get somewhere where there's running water and soap, uh, you can get rid of the oil before it has a chance to penetrate your skin. Um, remember though that water alone will not dissolve this oil. In fact, it can spread it. So make sure that you use soap and, and uh, thoroughly wash it. And the example that I wanted to give, uh, I was on a hike in Virginia up near the Shenandoah battlefield. And there's a place up there that the Appalachian Trail goes past that has a chain link fence. And that chain link fence was covered with poison ivy vines and they were sending out the, the branches uh, that were sticking out into the trail. And my, my hiking buddy that I've hiked with for years, I knew he was allergic to it. And he was pretty far ahead of me, but I watched his elbow graze that poison ivy vine. And he, um, he, he's an engineer, so he's more of an indoor, uh, his career was spent more indoors and he's also colorblind. So he doesn't always notice the plants and uh, I, I knew that he hadn't noticed that he had brushed up against it, so I told him about it. And instead of using soapy water, he just took his Nalgene bottle and poured water on the, the elbow that had touched it. And it ended up running the uh, oil all the way down his arm and onto his hand. And so when he got to camp, he had that rash all the way down his arm and onto his hand. So uh, just keep in mind that you, you need to use uh, soapy water and wash it thoroughly. Clothing, again, will help protect you initially. And I say initially because that oil can still be on the outside of that clothing. And so when you, when you do get home, uh, go somewhere into your laundry room or somewhere, strip down, take those clothes off and, and wash your hands and put something else on so that that oil doesn't uh, have an opportunity to get on you kind of after the fact. But long sleeves and long pants are preferable if you're gonna be in a place with poison ivy. Um, keep in mind that it can be inhaled. Um, 
I've heard reports of people that have had severe reactions and have been taken to the emergency room because they were burning brush that had poison ivy vine in it or because they had a campfire or even were burning wood at home that had the, the, the vines and the little anchor roots on the bark. And so as that was uh, put in the fire, that oil was volatilized and, uh, you know, I guess aerosol, whatever the word is, it was turned into an aerosol and it, it spread and they inhaled it. So if you're uh, gathering firewood, make sure you don't use trees that have poison ivy vines growing on them. Uh, or if it does have poison ivy on it and it's an oak or something that, that you want to use in the future, you can do uh, kind of a clip with uh, loppers and spray that uh, with um, triclopyr or 2,4-D or Roundup or something, and it will kill the poison ivy and allow the, the wood to continue to grow. After the vine rots, it's safe. So this isn't a long-term thing. That oil does break down, but it can persist for months. So just keep that in mind. Um, pets that have brushed up against poison ivy can also uh, pass that along to you. So if they've gone out and rolled in it or something like that, uh, and then they come up to you and you pet on them, uh, you can get it even if you've not touched it otherwise. Your hiking sticks or any tools that you might be using out in the woods can easily become uh, coated or, or uh, um, they can get it on them and then you can pick it up from those tools. Weed eaters and lawnmowers can, can spread it or aerosolize it, there's the word. And um, so you can end up inhaling it that way if you're uh, weed eating through a lot of it. So just be careful. Uh, also think about the fact that if, if you walk through it and it's on your boots or your boot laces and then you go to take your boots off, uh, it's now on your hands. So make sure you wash your hands as soon as you uh, take your boots off. And uh, any vines or handholds uh, or any vines that are hiding on handholds are sticking out on trails. This picture uh, raises the question and uh, Phil, I don't know if, if we've got the ability to, to do a little poll here, but uh, I was just curious, uh, how many people think that we have, um, how many of you have seen uh, these uh, plants in our area? I'll give you a chance to maybe unmute yourself and, and uh, maybe Phil can unmute everybody. They should be able to go over and under the, uh, uh, they should have a, uh, a yes, a green check. Uh, they should be able to hit. Okay. On that check. Again, the question is, how many of you have seen all three of these things in their area? And the reason why we're asking this question is it, it, it's a little bit of a trick question, but it's, it's not totally meant to be. Uh, there has been a running debate about this and Phil and I talked about it and we had a, a common opinion and we researched it a little bit and uh, it, it may be nuanced our opinion just a little, but um, any of you, you can put it in the chat box too if you'd rather do it by chat. Are you guys still there? Most are, most are saying they've seen the uh, poison ivy, yes, uh, but not necessarily the other two. Okay, very good. That makes me feel good. We've got uh, uh, astute uh, folks. So the thing that we are overwhelmingly most likely to see where we live is the eastern poison ivy. And you can see the distribution range of it. And truly, I'm shocked that Central Tennessee has a void like that in it. I would not expect that. I, I'm sure that that's just because that's all pasture land. But uh, maybe Phil can speak to that, why that would be the case in, case in Tennessee. But uh, Kentucky and, and Virginia are pretty well covered up with eastern poison ivy. I can think of very few places 
that you could go that you would not encounter poison ivy somewhere. I, I can't even think of very many places that I've been that I can't stand and look uh, maybe 20 or 30 yards out that I'm not seeing poison ivy. Um, it is prolific, uh, very widespread. Probably the only place that, that I see a little let up uh, in it, other than obviously on mountaintop uh, strip mine land, is uh, really cool north facing slopes. Sometimes I do not see it in those locations because it does tend to be a little more common uh, down south and there's even been some suggestion that with global warming that it's going to become more of an issue. I, I'm going to call BS on that a little bit just because uh, you look at the range and it's all the way up into Maine and into Canada. So I don't know how we would ever know that it had become more common because of warming temperatures, but that's that's what they say. So that's that's the 90 plus percent, uh, 95 plus percent plant that we have. The next one is the poison oak. And I have a lot of very, uh, I think, well-intentioned folks that will say, oh, we've got poison ivy, poison oak, and, and all these things, poison sumac here. And uh, it was always my impression that this was a Western uh, plant because you see it more uh, on the, the other maps. There's a specific kind of sumac or poison oak that is the Pacific poison oak. But we do actually have poison oak in the southeastern U.S., but it tends to be along sandy uh, places. And if you'll look at where it's growing, you can see that. In Virginia, you really don't pick it up until you get over in the Piedmont and it comes all the way down the, the mid-Atlantic uh, into places that like Florida that are very sandy soils and then up the Mississippi uh, River drainage. I have personally never laid eyes on this plant. And uh, Phil, have you ever seen poison oak? I have seen some plants that I, I was, I saw poison oak in California and I saw some uh, plants that I thought was poison oak in Tennessee, but I wasn't 100% sure. As we talked about earlier, there is quite a bit of variation in the poison ivy leaves. So it's possible it was just a very deeply lobed poison ivy, but I thought at the time it was it was poison oak. Okay. And then the last one would be the poison sumac. And this is supposed to be a small tree found only in wet areas. And it, even though it's showing it in Southwest Virginia and Eastern Kentucky, um, this is another one, Phil. I have never laid eyes on this plant. I've, I've seen a lot of people that thought they mistook staghorn sumac or um, is it common uh, sumac? Is that the name of the second one? Oh, well, there's a winged, winged sumac. Wing. Um, they mistook those for poison sumac and those are not poisonous at all. In fact, they're very beneficial to, to wildlife. Uh, but Phil, have you ever seen this one? I, I have never knowingly laid my eyes on poison sumac. I've, I've gotten a lot of calls, people asking, just like just like you said, they, they run across something and they're uh, afraid that it is poison sumac and when they send a picture, it's something else completely. Okay. So that should give you an indication of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my late forties, Phil's in his mid to late forties and, um, it can't be very common um, or we would have stumbled across it by, even by accident by now. But um, here's one that we do have in abundance and uh, this is stinging nettle. It tends to grow in places that, um, at least where I find it, it is lush, fertile, uh, usually north facing slopes and uh, the, the north side of Pine Mountain, probably uh, Black Mountain, uh, High Knob, those places uh, it seems to, to love to grow along wooded streams. Um, there's a place on the Pine Mountain Trail that is, uh, I, I, I take note of it because it's always thick with stinging nettle. And uh, this is one that um, my grandfather told me a story when I was growing up about a little beagle dog that ran into a patch of this and it got stung on the way in. And then when it tried to come out, 
it, it would get stung and it, it finally just laid down and was whimpering and they had to go into the stinging nettle patch to retrieve the little beagle dog. But uh, this, if, if you've ever touched it, you know exactly what it is. Um, it's not really bad. Uh, it feels uh, maybe a little bit like a bee sting, but maybe I don't think it's quite as bad as a bee sting. Uh, but the, the irritation from it, the, it, the stinging sensation, you'll feel like you're being stung over and over again, uh, even though uh, you're not touching it anymore, uh, which is a curious thing. Kind of like uh, bee stings do that same thing to me. But uh, it, it'll uh, cause swelling, redness, uh, and usually it's just a little small dot and uh, itching that is associated with stinging nettle. If you look in this photo, I don't know if you all can see my cursor or not, but just at the, on that stem, I can see three different spines. And those spines are actually the part of the plant that's doing the, the stinging. And uh, as long as you avoid those, uh, you don't have a problem. So if you, and there's a few things you can do, this plant is actually edible. And so folks do use it. And if you put it in boiling water just for a few seconds, it removes the stinger. And so that's, if you've heard of people that have used this in a salad or something, that's what they've done. They, they removed the stinger. And it's supposed to have uh, great health benefits, but uh, it causes an immediate reaction. And uh, the, re the reaction is caused by formic acid, which I believe is the same thing that are, that's in ant bites. But um, it also has a histamine that causes a little bit of allergic reaction. And in the, the book that I was using as a reference, I'll tell you about it here at the end, uh, it said that it, it, the plant also has uh, serotonin in it, uh, which was uh, surprising to me. Uh, kind of interesting that that plant would have that in it. But uh, again, you get that, that itching, that redness for about 30 to 40 minutes. If you do happen to be in a place that you get uh, poison ivy or stinging nettle, if if there's jewelweed or spotted touch me not around, you can mash that up and rub it on it and it'll make the stinging go away from the sting nettle and it will cut down on the itching of the poison ivy. So that's just kind of a little uh, woodland remedy for those two. We do have a couple of other plants that can also cause contact reactions in some people. Jack in the pulpit, certain milkweed species, uh, lady slipper, and Virginia creeper in some people. Uh, Phil, do you want to talk about those? Well, I think, um, like you said, some people, uh, I've never had reaction with any of those as far as touching, but some people will. So um, I, I've, I've had people argue with me that Virginia creeper is actually poison oak. And, uh, and some people have had a reaction to it. And, and early in my extension career, I dismissed that and as I researched it I thought wow you know some people can have a rash from touching Virginia creeper but it's it's very few people not many people do same with lady slipper and uh, and I've never had a reaction with the jack in the pulpit or milkweed species too but uh, everybody's different so uh, so know your own limitations and, um, and if you have a reaction uh, it could be something uh, in this list here okay we're going to very quickly go into the ones that are uh, plants that you can ingest. And I started off with the one that uh, I think is most important because it's the one that there is no treatment for. And that would be the, the death cat mushroom. And it is very common in oak woods in our area. And it, it kind of has that olive uh, colored uh, cap to it. There are gills underneath and you'll usually see a little collar at the base and another little collar that's up under the cap. Usually the stem is around three to five inches tall and the, the cap itself is three to six inches wide. And they say that if you get really close and smell of it, um, that it has an ammonia smell to it. Uh, but again, that olive green. And this is one that causes uh, liver shutdown, um, uh, kidney failure, and uh, other things, and there's no treatment for it. If you happen to be lucky enough to be near a hospital that has the ability to do a really thorough uh, kidney dialysis, uh, that can help. But uh, otherwise, um, 
uh, adios. So you need to make sure that if you don't know what a mushroom it really truly is, uh, if you can't identify it with 100% certainty, do not consume it. Uh, but we do have some other plants that, that have varying degrees of uh, toxicity or, or the ability to poison. Uh, the Buckeye, uh, Kentucky coffee tree, uh, and that would be primarily the pulp of the coffee tree, but I, I think maybe the, the seeds were at one time used as, as coffee, uh, but the, I think it's the pulp around the seeds that's the problem. Uh, which if you've ever tried to take the seeds out of a Kentucky coffee tree pod, um, it's difficult to remove it. It's kind of slimy. But mountain laurel and rhododendron are, are both uh, poisonous, and even the honey uh, from these are poisonous. White baneberry, which is also known as doll's eyes, uh, is poisonous. Uh, hemp dogbane, uh, there, there's some question about whether it's poisonous to humans, um, but um, we know it's poisonous to dogs and, and other um, livestock, so I, I wouldn't chance that one. Uh, Jack in the Pulpit has, uh, I think it's uh, oxalate crystals or something that it'll cause a burning in your mouth and um, it, it can cause death if you continue to eat Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, May apple, the fruit itself, if it's totally ripe, is, is safe to eat, but all the rest of the plant is poisonous. And the immature fruit is uh, poisonous. Black nightshade, uh, poison hemlock, uh, American pokeweed, and uh, I think Phil and I both wanted to talk about the pokeweed, but um, um, I was telling him earlier that we had a, a construction crew that built our extension office, and one of the guys dared one of the others to or fooled him into eating se several of the pokeweed berries. He lied to him and told him that they were good to eat. And uh, he ended up hallucinating and uh, was taken to the emergency room. And he was kind of talking out of his head. And uh, uh, Phil, I think you wanted to say something with pokeweed. Uh, I was just gonna mention, we had a situation where uh, the local newspaper did a story on a family that collects and cans their the, the pokeweed every year, and they they had told the editor that uh, the fact that it's toxic is a myth, and they were basing that on the fact that they'd eaten it for years and had never been been poisoned. And and luckily, the the editor had enough uh, sense to call me up, call, contact me on a Sunday afternoon, and just didn't feel comfortable printing that uh, that it was uh, that there was no toxicity. So so she included a blurb by me in there saying, hey, there are some toxins in this plant, so, so be careful. Now, now, they are most concentrated, I believe, in the roots and in the seeds, but that toxin can be found throughout the plant. The people will eat the leaves when they are very young. Obviously, that's what poke salad, what we call poke salad, comes from, but that's when it's immature. Uh, once it gets up over uh, maybe eight or 10 inches high, it's beginning to take on the uh, qualities that make it toxic. So um, I would not recommend eating it. it it's curious to me that black bears uh, eat these berries in abundance uh, when they set on, uh, but, but not humans. Uh, Larkspur is another one that's kind of the light lavender or purple flower that you might see in the spring. Uh, that's one that is poisonous. Uh, mistletoe, um, I think Phil made some uh, crack about uh, many a uh, uh, wife had poisoned her husband with mistletoe. Um, <laughs> I, I've not had that happen yet, though I'm, I'm not going to let her know about it. Uh, we don't want her to be too educated. She might make use of that. Uh, Phil, do you want to talk about sassafras? Uh, well, the sassafras, and, and I tell people, and I know, Shad, you're, you're uh, you try to avoid the sassafras. I'll make sassafras tea still, maybe once or twice a year, but it is proven to be carcinogenic. So, uh, so definitely wouldn't recommend having a, a cup of sassafras tea every week. It's it's something. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the of the compound, saffron maybe that that's in sassafras plant, and um, and, and it is. 
it, it is carcinogenic. So, uh, so just bear that in mind. Okay. Holly berries and mountain ash berries. Uh, mountain ash is something uh, that you would probably encounter up on Black Mountain or over High Knob. The places that I've seen it uh, are like up in the Shenandoah. It, it tends to grow at, at very high elevations. But anyway, a lot of our plants can have uh, poisonous attributes. And, and uh, I'll get to the chase here in just a second. If On the poison ivy, wash it immediately before it penetrates your skin. On the poisonous plants, if ingested, and I'm thinking hopefully this is, um, I would think that most adults know enough not to eat something unless they know for sure what it is. Most of the time it's small children that are out and something looks tasty to them. If they see a berry or something, they, they eat it and they, um, you know, they, they tend to put things in their mouth. And so uh, my high school biology teacher had an expression that the dose makes the poison. And so we can, we can handle a little bit of almost anything. Uh, but if you get enough of it, uh, even something that maybe wouldn't cause a problem in, in small doses, kind of like Phil sassafras tea, uh, if you drink enough of it or eat enough of it, you're going to start to have uh, the problems from the toxins. And so as far as treatment and what to do, it's mainly about adsorption to prevent absorption. And so uh, what you're doing is you're, you're uh, give them uh, an activated charcoal tablet. I don't know if any of you all have ever tried that before. Um, I tried it one time uh, for stomach upset and um, I also gave some to my dog one time because he ate some rat poison and it, it is, um, if you've ever seen the Patriot when she gives him the uh, or puts the ink in his tea and turns his teeth black or purple uh, that's about what charcoal will do. Uh, but if it's life and death, you're not worried about having black teeth. Uh, but anyway, the charcoal is more uh, able to absorb uh, the compound than your stomach lining is. And so uh, it's many hundreds of times more able to absorb that. So what it's doing is it's binding the toxins so that they can't be taken up by your body. And so um, that would be uh, one thing that if you keep that on hand, but, uh, that would be a good thing. If I had small children, uh, that would be something that I would probably recommend that you keep. Uh, milk uh, can also uh, be a lot more able to uh, bind up the, the toxins, and, and in some cases, it can even neutralize it. As far as emetics, you know, the, the old recommendation used to be to give them Epicac uh, syrup, and it's an emetic, it makes them vomit. And uh, the research through the years, though, has started to reveal that the, the, there's no evidence that it helps the outcome. And in some ways, it's negative because it delays administering activated charcoal or something that would actually be beneficial. So I don't think for most things, they no longer recommend the emetics. Uh, if you get to the hospital, they do have some pharmaceutical antagonists that can be used that will uh, neutralize uh, the, the compounds in other ways, but not for all things. Uh, so the rule of thumb, when in doubt, never consume any plant or part of a plant that you're not familiar with. And I would always recommend that you educate yourself by learning the plants that are gonna be growing in the areas where you're gonna go before you go. You don't wanna find out the hard way of, uh, oh, your kid has eaten a pokeberry. Uh, what was it they said about that? Um, you need to, to know. And some of this knowledge is lost these days. And um, you might find that it's a little difficult to find a good source. But uh, I know there are some extension sites that have poisonous plants for livestock. Uh, there's also, I've come across some extension sites that went into poisonous plants and house plants and that kind of thing. Uh, but this North American uh, Guide to Common Poisonous Plants and Mushrooms uh, by Timber Press. I don't know if you all can see that uh, on the uh, uh, on the screen or not, but that's a really good book. It tells you what what's toxic about it, 
and what parts of the plant are toxic and what you can do about it. So that's all I've got, Phil. Got any questions for Shad? Uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly, just talk uh, briefly about back, uh, backcountry water safety. And um, it's something that I, I think a lot of people neglect. They'll have plenty of food with them, but not necessarily um, enough water or, or way to get water. And I, I put this picture up. I think this is down at the Pinnacle in uh, Russell County, Virginia. But you see this and you're thirsty, you've been on a hike, it's a hot summer day would you drink this? And even though it may look pristine, it may look uh, uh, very clean, uh, there are some things to be concerned about. And I would say that if you're going to make use of a wild water source like this, we, we like to go after the running water where um, you're going to have less contamination in the still water because things are going to have a chance to settle out. But there's some things to, to bear in mind when you're uh, choosing a, a backcountry country water source, uh, you're going to run into some possibility of protozoans, and that's a classification of organisms that uh, would include the Giardia. You might have heard the term beaver fever, where you get really bad diarrhea from the water. That's Giardia. And there's another protozoan known as Cryptosporidium. It will cause the same type of reaction. And there's some belief that once you get some of these into your system, it's like malaria. You'll continue to have flare-ups. You can treat it, you can knock it back, but for the rest of your life, you, you're going to have some flare-ups from time to time of the Giardia or the Cryptosporidium. Other things we need to be concerned about in the water, bacteria, especially E. coli. If, you're, um, if there's a farm field, for example, livestock operation near the water source, or, or even if if campers or possums make use of, uh, of, of upstream areas for, for defecation and viruses. I will say that for the most part in the United States, viruses in the water are not as much of a concern. But if you're somebody who frequents other parts of the world, if you're ever in third world countries, then you do need to be mindful of viruses. The thing about viruses typically is they're pretty species specific. So in order for a human to get a virus from, from defecation, it would have had to have been the defecation upstream from another human in a lot of cases. And then there's a possibility of chemicals, whether it's a landscape or ag fertilizers or motor oil or um, pesticides. And those we're not going to really talk about, number one, because if you're in the back country, there's less of a chance that your water is exposed to those. And number two is, is because getting those out of your drinking water can be pretty challenging in the back country. It, it requires some technology such as reverse osmosis or some pretty high end uh, charcoal filters to, to take chemicals out of the water. So we're just going to focus mainly on the protozoans, the bacteria and the viruses. Uh, I think it's good to get a, a general idea of the size of some of these organisms and uh, a unit of measurement that we'll talk about is a micron. A micron is one millionth of a meter. And the cryptosporidium and the giardia, the giardia again is what causes the beaver fever. Those will range in size from one micron to 300 microns. The bacterias will range from 0.1 to 10 microns. Uh, viruses from 0.005 to 0.1 microns. So, so ranking these in, in terms of the largest and the smallest, just like you see it here, the protozoans, the bacteria, and then the viruses. This image that you see on the right, that's E. coli, which we hear a lot about, uh, can come from just about any mammal. Uh, if there's defecation, if there's uh, livestock and water has run down a pasture field into the into the creek, then you could get a an E. coli contamination and give you an idea of sizing. 
these are going to be one to two microns in length and they're going to be about a half micron in diameter. Now that's important when we talk about filtration versus purification because if you use a water filter, um, I have one when I first started backpacking, I bought a, a pump water filter and I think it uh, treated down to 0.2 microns. So it would get most of the bacteria, but not all. A lot of the filters that you see now, including the Sawyer filter, and I have one of those. That's something that I keep in my hiking bag. It's very small, it's, it's pretty affordable as far as, as filtering your water. That's gonna take things down to 0.1 microns. So that's gonna eliminate the possibility of any of those uh, protozoans. It's gonna eliminate the possibility of any bacteria. Again, these won't filter out viruses, but in the United States, generally speaking, we don't have to worry so much about viruses in the streams and the rivers and the lakes. So 99 out of 100 times, a filter is gonna be just fine for, uh, for backcountry uh, water preparation. If you decide you want to purify the water and kill those viruses and basically kill everything, you've got a few options. Boiling is going to be a good way to do it. Um, the thing about all or most of these purification methods is they're going to take some time in contrast to the filtration. You're going to have to invest several minutes to possibly several hours. So the boiling is something you can do that's going to kill everything. And the recommendation these days is to get your water to a good rolling boil and allow it to continue for a full minute. Now, when I was in Boy Scouts, I think that was different. Um, I'd have to consult that Boy Scout handbook that uh, Shad and I talked about a couple weeks ago. But I think they said boil your water for five minutes and then add another minute for every thousand feet in elevation that you are. But they, they've come to, to back up on that and say, if you get a good rolling boil going for a minute. Now, if you're above 5,000 feet, the recommendation is three minutes. So if you're camping at Mount LeConte or you're up on Mount Rogers, um, then, then you let it go a little longer, but, uh, but it's still quite a bit less than what they used to recommend. Another thing that you can do is, is use iodine and you can buy these iodine tablets. You can also just carry a little, little vial if you wanted to of, of iodine, a tincture of iodine and put that in the water. I'll tell you the taste is horrible. Um, I've used these tablets a lot and I don't like the taste. Most of the packaging now comes with a second tablet that you add that improves the taste, takes it back to normal. But still, it's, it's a big time commitment to, to use these uh, iodine tablets. So if you're using just straight iodine and an eye droplet, you want to put five drops per quart of water. If the water's clear, you can use up to 10 drops if you're putting that into murky water. And then you want to wait, once you apply that, you want to wait about 30 minutes before you drink that water. Another thing about iodine is there are people who are allergic to iodine. Um, so um, if you're allergic to iodine, of course, you want to look at other options for your water purification. You can also add chlorine and you can do the same way with the chlorine as you do with iodine. You can put it in a droplet and an eyedropper, carry that with you. Uh, or you can buy um, water purification tablets that are chlorine based. Now, if you're gonna use uh, an eyedropper, you can use just household bleach, but make sure that it's just regular bleach. It's not scented. It's not uh, fresh scent or lemon scent. Just, just a bottle of regular household bleach will be, be fine for that. And the recommendation for the household bleach, again, regular household bleach is two drops per quart of water, or if it's murky water, four drops. And just like with the iodine, you wanna wait uh, about 30 minutes before you then utilize that water. What you want is, is once that water is treated with chlorine, it want, you want it to have a smell that's somewhat similar to a swimming pool, but you don't want it to taste like a swimming pool. So if that taste is overwhelming, it, it's very strong chlorine taste, one thing you can do is just open up that water, expose it to the air for a little while, and some of that chlorine aroma and flavor will, will dissipate from the water. 
There's also the possibility of purifying your water with ultraviolet light. And um, there's a product that came out several years ago. It's, it's a very small product. Uh, it's called a SteriPen and it supposedly uses ultraviolet light. You put it in your water bottle and turn it on for a certain amount of time and it's supposed to kill the viruses, the bacteria, and the protozoans. And when that first came out, I was pretty skeptical, but uh, most of the reports I've seen since then, um, you know, it does work. It, it is a, a viable option that you can use for purifying your water. It's expensive. I've never t made the investment. It runs on a battery. Uh, I think it's over $100 to buy one of those SteriPens. But that got me thinking, um, if the SteriPen will purify the water, will sunlight purify the water? And, and the answer is yes. Although it does take, a, take some commitment. This is the SteriPen here on the left. And the CDC has some information on solar sterilization of water, where you just take, uh, you, you put the, uh, the water to be treated in plastic or glass bottles, and you put them in direct sunlight, but that takes six hours. But, um, but they have confirmed there's, there's areas in third world countries where there was a high incidence of, of chronic diarrhea and they've documented that those rates have gone down considerably in the areas where they've, they've pushed the, uh, the solar purification. But that's an option if you're in a camp, you're, you're kind of planning ahead, you've got some time to spare, uh, that might be a possibility for, for purifying your water is, is using the sun. So keep in mind that water is heavy. Um, you, you can always carry all the water that you think you're going to need plus some extra, but a liter of water is going to be 2.2 pounds. So uh, there are some cases if you're out multiple days or if you're out uh, for, for a long day, that could be a whole lot of water and a whole lot of extra weight. So it is a good idea to, to carry something to purify or filter the water. So consider that way, consider the time considerations, whether you want to filter, whether you want to, want to purify your water with iodine or chlorine, because um, that, that can be time consuming. And then have a backup, even if you have enough water, uh, again, you know, have some kind of backup system. This uh, Sawyer mini filter that I keep in my hiking kit, there have been two cases where we've had somebody injure an ankle on a hiking trip that started in the morning. And in both of those cases, it was after 7 p.m. before we got out of the woods. And had I not had something to filter water or to treat water, um, and we would have been very uncomfortable. So having something that's, uh, that's useful in that kind of scenario is a good idea. And again, you can find some, they're not very costly, uh, they're not very heavy, uh, but there are some options for, for making sure that you have some, some good water. They also make the, um, the survival straws, they're called. So, so these things are even cheaper than the Sawyer Mini. They would go down into your untreated water and then you just drink it like you would from a straw. And that, that's also an effective way to keep out those, uh, the, the bacteria and the protozoans. And there's also some belief in some circles that over the years, a lot of these horror stories you've, you've heard in the woods about um, people getting beaver fever or, or other gastrointestinal problems from untreated water. In a lot of cases, that could have been because your, your buddy took his dirty hand and, and stuck that dirty hand down into your bag of trail mix. Um, so there is some, uh, you know, I, I think over the last few months, we've all learned the value of hand washing and that is something that, that could be at play in some of these backcountry situations as well. Okay. And I'm gonna stop right there. Phil, I was gonna say while you're uh, talking about uh, the water stuff, uh, one of the worst illnesses I ever had was from Giardia. Um, I can even tell you the place that I got it was uh, outside of Irwin, Tennessee uh, at the beauty spot and I had diarrhea 40 times a day for three days mm. and it got to the point that I could not uh, move anymore I was bed bound and I had to have help uh, get into the car to go to the hospital 
So uh, I was severely dehydrated. It, it can be uh, the end of a very pleasant uh, outdoor experience. <laughs> well, well, let me, I know this is a personal question, but uh, have you had flare ups since then that, that you suspect are the, are the Giardia? Uh, they treated me with Flagyl, uh, which is a um, kind of a generic treatment for that. And it, it, uh, after they treated me, I had the best uh, digestive health of my life for about uh, five or six years. And then it started coming back and they treated me again. And right now I'm doing well again, but I believe that was accurate, that it comes back. Okay. So, so you would testify that's not something you, you want to get in the first place. You, you would recommend no. taking steps to avoid it. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for sticking with us. If there are any questions, uh, we will we will answer those. Otherwise, um, okay, you all are welcome. Um, otherwise, our next presentation is coming up on Tuesday, and that's going to be Summer Smith from Wise. She's going to talk about uh, drone use in agriculture. And I think it'll be a be a good presentation. She's been featured on several news uh, outlets with her drone. She was telling me there was a magazine interviewer just this week on uh, how she uses drones on her, uh, her farm. So I think she may share one of those videos that was recorded by a by a news outlet uh, on Tuesday night. Sounds good. Looking forward to it. Jeremy and uh, Shad, you all have anything before we close the door? I know like the preacher that talked too long and uh, somebody's ham is going to be over.